Read that next. This is the Krill Cast. I am Chris. Um, well, I asked you a question, Chris. <laughs> and I'm I'll answer it after we introduce ourselves. <laughs> this is our series called What Now? Printed. And pressed. And that is the right order. <laughs> Will, what was your question? Okay, do I read the last battle next? No, no, no. no. You're out. You, this says, look, look at this spine. It says book one. Yes. Well, my book says book six. Thank that's you. Because you have that's the old printing. Have, okay, yeah, that's in the. You're in publication, publication order. order, not. Yeah. All right. So, dip, dip shitty kiss. That's why I'm asking you which one I read next. Because <laughs> my one is the last. Lie, the, lie the, in the wish in the wardrobe yeah. next. Okay. The description <laughs> is how's evil come to Narnia, and that just Here. seems like it made yeah, sense. So, so yeah. it goes, Here, here's the order of the books for you, Will. How am I supposed to be that? Chris? Magician's <laughs> nephew, Lion, Witch, and Wardrobe, Horse and His Boy. Uh, then it's what Prince Caspian, Don Trader. Oh, it doesn't have Don Trader, Don <laughs> Treader. <laughs> the Don <laughs> Trader. It's really he wakes up at dawn to trade people. Yeah, it's it's chronological order uh, in the way they print them now. When they originally and, printed them, there was a disconnect between just America okay. and the British. Yeah. The, so so here, here, about, here's the, the here's, no, 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 just real quick. So just for the record, let's get in this publication order versus chronological order. Yeah. There are some arguments to be made to read publication order versus chronological order, but we have chosen public or, uh, chronological order because there is a timeline that exists. And yeah. if you read them in the publication order, then you go in, oh. pub, you go in like chronological order until Magician's Nephew, and then you go back in time, and then you finish Last Battle. So it's kind of a weird way to read it. It sends you back and then sends you back forward. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's, I mean, yes, there's some value to it because um, if you read Magician's Nephew first, then you pretty much know what Aslan is without having to read any of the other books. I don't think there's ever a mystery, though. It depends on how old you are. <laughs> it, there, okay, I'll, I'll say this, though. There is a letter that a fan sent in. Yeah, and then C.S. Lewis, Lewis asking, which way was the right order. And C.S. Lewis did say that he leans towards chronological order. Yes, so, he did do that. But he also yeah, said well, it, I think it makes doesn't sense. matter. <laughs> yeah, well, at the end of the day, so, like, obviously, I have not read this one before. And um, it was nice seeing how it tied in. I don't know if it would have – that payoff in the end would have felt as great if I hadn't read Lion, the Ocean Wardrobe before this one. So I'll, I'll say this. As a kid reading it, when I was a kid, I thought this book was the most boring book in the entire series. Yeah, well, not very much happens. Yeah, so <laughs> I understand the argument of saying not telling your kids to read this one first, maybe, but it has a lot of great messages in it that I think are very valuable if they can, you know, maybe understand them. Also, so, the witch is seven feet tall. I never realized that. Yeah. Yeah, man. And big woman. Chris likes that. <laughs> <laughs> so, did you guys notice with uh, Karn and the whole um, secret word that it's basically nuclear weapon anxiety? I did not get that until you said it. And I was like, yeah. oh, okay. Yeah, it's because this book was written 10 years after the bomb was dropped. Mm hmm kind of going into the height of the Cold War. So it makes a lot of sense that he kind of wrote the doomsday scenario I mean, for Karn to be that. If you don't know what goes into um, an atomic weapon, then you might think it's magic. Right. I mean, also it just kills everything that's within the blast. Right. I mean, so. fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. I mean, I thought the magic word was love. <laughs> <laughs> I, so... I, I want to get started with the opening sequence, though. I, I right, like how right. C.S. Lewis writes intros to things and sets you up Diggory was for blubbering. Understanding. Right, yeah, Diggory. And it wasn't even from his perspective until after the first chapter, right? Yeah, it was from... Uh, it was from Polly's perspective. Polly, yeah. Which was interesting because you, you, I knew going into this that Diggory was the main character. But if I wasn't he had just listened to, to Polly the entire time, nothing bad would have happened. <laughs> right. Diggory's an idiot. Diggory is, yeah, it was like the opposite of Adam and Eve, which is part of what this story is, right? Where the, the instead of tempting him, she was trying to keep him away from the temptation. Anyways, well, but I, I like I like the opening sequence where uh, she's walking up and he's crying because 
his mom is really sick. And it's something you don't really think about throughout the entire book. But then towards the end, when he's being tempted, they bring that back. And that's mm-hmm. a super, like... It's brought up again. It's well written. It is brought up again multiple times. Yeah. Like when the witch comes into the world and he's concerned about if the witch were to go into his mother's room. Yep. So there, there are a lot of times that does get brought up again to remind yeah, just remind you throughout the story yeah yeah um, and uh, go on Andrew, uh, sorry. You, you can say if you're going to add something to that specifically uh, i was just going to say how it was brought up in the end it was really great because uh the temptation is not necessarily an evil thing so mm-hmm. it wasn't like he wanted power and glory for himself uh in essence if he would have gone with the temptation he was still doing a good mm-hmm. um so that's made it much harder to resist because, you know, you're still helping someone that you love. Right. Right. I thought there was a really good, um, going back to what you were saying though, about her not tempting him. I mean, she was tempted into grabbing the ring. <laughs> so she te- kind of technically starts the whole thing still, uh, mm-hmm. in line with Adam and Eve, but, um, and Uncle Andrew, right? His name's it's Uncle Andrew, right? Yeah, Uncle Andrew. <laughs> That's what you need to change it, your It's name very for. fitting. Yeah, I know. I had to I, I always take a double take for a second there. But that character when you when you've read the screw tape letters though, with the toast and everything, he takes on a different tone. Yeah, he definitely does. He, he's much more that hubristic uh scientist. He's like he he showcases that he believes he can do anything he wants. To achieve the mm-hmm. end goals, like he doesn't care what the collateral he, damage is. He, he's the epitome of when I think of just because you can doesn't mean you should. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, like when and, he explains yeah. how he shouldn't have asked for permission of the guinea pigs, uh, yeah. I thought that was a really telling yeah. conversation. But beyond that, it's like a really. It, there's even a deeper element there, right? Because this this is Diggory's uncle. It's showing that you can't, you might not even be able to trust your uncle, mm-hmm. which kind of goes into the where child abuse most likely happens when you yeah, think about it. family and friends, right? So, I I think that there's a lot of telling children to you know if you have a gut instinct that something's wrong, you should listen to it. Where mm-hmm. Diggory doesn't listen to it fast enough, and Polly gets lured, and then they're sent on this whole <laughs> terrible mission. Yes. Hey, mm-hmm. you want to hear something funny? At at about nine eighteen, before we started the podcast, I got a message from Hugh Moran, and he said the Magician's Nephew is one of the best books of all time, and I have no idea how he knew we were covering that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm still confused. I messaged him. He might come on later. We'll see. Okay. But uh, apparently, he said it's one of the Hugh Moran quote. I and I quote: "The Magician's Nephew is one of the best books of all time." I don't know if I would put it in that category. That, that's that's his words. That's his words. I mean, as far as the messages in it, I, I as an adult now rereading it, I I really appreciate that book though. There's a yeah. lot. Yeah, I just the thing is that I feel like other books do the same, very similar or the same messages, and they do, they do it better in a more exciting novel. That's fair, but this is for kids. <laughs> yeah, but still, is the <laughs> Hobbit. I mean, I mean, yeah, but. Okay, there's the um, there's the concept when they're in Karn, and the you know queen is over there, and she's talking about her view of the people, right? She's a ruler who viewed the people as hers, mm-hmm. like her possession. There's no there's no connection to humanity there. The rules are for thee, not for me, kind of concept, right? Mm-hmm. So. It, it really does scream a lot of the elements that the screw tape letters is complaining about among leaders, academics, yep. what whatever you can think of in that book. It really he's kind of showcasing those um, lack of morals. Right, so this is the beginner's guide to uh, or baby's guide to screw tape letters. It kind you of know is, what. Actually. I just I just realized though there is two Adam and Eve moments in this book. You know mm-hmm. what the first one is? What? When Uncle Andrew offers them the rings. That's what I Didn't we just say that? I literally just Five minutes ago. That. I'm sorry, oh. I got distracted. I literally told you that the the um I didn't think about that. Sorry. As if it's the apple. 
right there. It's the ring. And then that starts the whole journey. So yeah, I'm it, sorry, Andrew. I didn't mean to. Just say, that was thunder. that was at like two minutes in. <laughs> <laughs> right after you're like, oh, they. No, I got distracted. Opposite. I got distracted. Like, I missed it. Well, I'm sorry, guys. Yeah, she's she technically. So it's almost like uh, really, I guess there's three then, right? Uh, there's the there's ring. the bell. There's yes, the there's the bell, there's the rings, and, there's, and then there's the, the literal apple. Then there's yeah. the literal apple. Yeah. But so there's three but moments. C.S. Lewis is just doesn't have a creative bone in his body, always ripping well, but, up the Bible. Well, what what, what I found <laughs> most interesting, though, is you have Polly fails, then Diggory fails, then from the... the um, the No, from the virtue of his mother, he succeeds on the third attempt. But I'm saying that there's I a, feel like you're trying to tie, tie this in the Mary really happy. No, I'm day. not. No, one of one of the one of the major discussions that C.S. Lewis has later on is about how children without a guiding parent are going to commit stupid acts or yeah, make children. unvirtuous yeah. choices. Well, I mean, but not... but children who are who are learn who have have the um, guidance of a parent, especially a virtuous one, are more likely to make the right choice. And that was what he was making out in that moment where he realizes like his mom would not want him to do that. I, I just would like to point out that the bell is a prime example of unintended consequences. Oh yeah. For actions <laughs> taken in ignorance. Mm. Like the whole uh, rule where if you see a fence, you don't just destroy it until you understand why the fence is there. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's, one of those things where there's a rule, don't hit the freaking bell. Uh, <laughs> but going back to Chris's point, though, just real quick, um, he does not make the decision not to do it on his mother. He actually does it because he, she, the witch suggests for him to leave Polly. That's right. why he decides that was, to. That is what made him wake up a little yeah, bit. Yeah, so it wasn't his mom. Yeah. But no, his, he says his mom would not want him. Yeah, to but he was, still, he was still going to go through with it. And then she said, you should leave Polly. Yeah. Yeah, he broke the trance. I, so, ha! I just view it as a, I view that as a redemption moment. Like both children fail their tests, right? Their first tests, and then the third test, there's redemption. Yeah, it's it's tough because they're children. So how could they really fail? They don't really know what they're doing. I mean, no, but they're they're hoodwinked on the first two. Both yeah, of them are fair. hoodwinked, yes. and then they have the redemption of not being tempted or tricked in the mm -hmm. third instance. That's that's just how I see it. So. You know what? Also, book also goes over these themes. The stand, Paralan next Paralandra, <laughs> Paralandra, Paralandra. Um, that is my probably one? my that's yeah, probably my that. favorite C.S. Lewis book was Paralandra. I don't know if I'd go that far, but Paralandra oh, it, like is very haunting because you see Eve's temptation in real time. It is. It's very ha so that's, haunting, haunting. It's very uncomfortable. We should definitely do the space trilogy when Narnia is over. <laughs> And it's a quick read too, Andrew. Just like Narnia is a quick I think, read. Uh, Chris has a C.S. Lewis hard on recently. <laughs> it's like does, does Lewis. Lewis. Narnia, the space trilogy. What else did he write, Chris? It's the, the only trilogy. author Chris knows. <laughs> well, so here's the other thing that I found interesting was Uncle Andrew learned all of this stuff from the great aunt, who was a fairy, fairy I, blood. right? Fairy, fairy, fairy bl blood. Oh, fairy blood. That's right, fairy blood. So like. He didn't really understand what he was dabbling in, and nobody explained it to him. He's got the ignorance of a child who's all grown up and thinks he's smart. It's like, just like Andrew said before, it's a direct parallel to basically every scientist ever. Yeah. They think yeah. they know everything, but there's so many unknown quanti uh, quantifiers in every field of science, really. Well, mm -hmm. you can convince yourself that things are known or that things are safe or that things are, are within the bounds of understanding without actually having a good understanding of stuff. Like, for example, it's a logical fallacy that, that you equate two things you don't understand into something you do understand and then just keep following that train of thought. I don't understand what you mean. I mean, if, if, there, if there are two things you don't understand, but together they make sense. Like, for example, if let's just say you're a child and you know that blue and yellow make green, but you don't know why. Like I mean, that's just, like literally how it. entire civilizations are built, Chris. I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying when it comes to science, if you take two theorems you don't understand, but together you understand the the, the combination of them, you don't understand the foundation of it. 
that's like, science though, Chris. That's my point. Yeah, it's like I'll, you don't know how you, you don't know you've pushed too far until you push too far. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's what I'm saying. Holy you can cow. get outcomes without understanding yeah. the basis of the outcome. Yes. That's that's the key, right? It's you don't understand the rules of what you're actually playing with. It's like gravity. We don't know how it works, yeah. but everything's based off of it. Exactly. I think um, another really interesting part where um, the uncle and the witch, when uh, when Aslan is singing, their reaction. It's, oh, yeah. That was an important moment. It's, yeah. It, it's one of those things where they don't want to hear what he's saying. Mm-hmm. So they've convinced themselves that it's the worst sounding music on the planet. <laughs> Oh, no, but before we get there, though, I think it's best if we go through it a journey through the journey as it happens. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so the wood between the worlds, I thought was an excellent That was really cool. Transition. Yeah. And then the I film. realized that Nightmare Nightmare Before Christmas stole that idea. Oh, yeah, they yeah. definitely did. Okay. Yeah, yeah well, they I have a whole scene there. where they go into, like, a world between worlds, and they jump yeah. into trees that are different holidays. They didn't steal. It was just inspired by. I yeah. never really watched it, so. No, I really liked it. <laughs> That one used to give me actual nightmares before Christmas when I was a kid. <laughs> but anyways, long story short, the wood between the worlds was it was an interesting thing because then Diggory actually tested the theories of his uncle, and that's when they found out how the rings actually worked and what they were actually meant to do. Yeah, it was cool. And then right. I was questioning how the heck that wardrobe works, but that's a whole different story. Yeah, well. <laughs> it tied in really nicely, though, because he kind yeah. of made it, – it made – no sense, but sense at the same time. It's magical. Yeah. I mean, that's the overarching theme. I mean, the tree incorporated the rings into its root system or something. Who knows? It must it's, have, yeah. Also, the no World idea. Between Worlds was obviously the loading program of the Matrix. <laughs> <laughs> so I like then, how it didn't work when they would just step in the puddles. They had yes. to actually activate it. And then uh, after that, they go to Karn, which is the mm-hmm. Queen's Realm. The Witch. Yeah. So after, after the word between the worlds, they figure out how it works, and they're like, oh, let's just go randomly go to a different puddle, because that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> like, the logic there is totally Christ, the logic of a totally child. totally do it, too, if you were a kid. Yeah, yeah if I you were a kid, would've. oh, for yeah. sure. How unfortunate is the first one they step into is that terrible place. Right. <laughs> I mean, is it a terrible place, per se? Well, well you, you did know, though, as it was coming on, that the sun being bleak was a problem. Like, you right. knew that I was going to be a dying, problem. It's a dying sun so yeah. which is very similar to the first book of the space trilogy with the dying world and the light being kind of shuttered very similar like c.s lewis writes a lot of similar themes across his books right i i like the uh concept that he goes with though of when one world ends another one kind of begins mm-hmm. i think that's mm-hmm. a really good concept just given how for every star out there that is dying i mean new ones are being made, I mean, to be fair, the, the end of the Chronicles of Narnia basically follows the same pattern. It does, yeah. Don't ruin it but, for me. I haven't read the end yet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I said pattern. I didn't say how it does it. Just, you know, whatever. All right. So, but I, I thought it was funny. They get there and they see all these people who are like them, but not like them. They're bigger than them by quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And they're all seated and they're like kings and queens, duchesses and dukes and all that other fun stuff because they're dressed up like that. And as you get closer and closer to the queen, the expression on the faces of the people gets more and more bleak. Yeah, I mean, well, you're also seeing, um, you're also seeing how their culture progressed, right? Like, yeah, you had a you had a world where they never thought about using that secret word, right? Mm-hmm. They knew it, but they never thought they would ever use it, kind of thing. And then you see how the culture corrupted on that on that planet, right? And then you get to the queen herself who is the epitome of evil vindictiveness right she thought everything was hers she was losing so she used she was above the law well i mean she was losing too that's the key thing that people Mm -hmm. might miss in this right she she literally was losing to her sister for the throne when she was trying to take it from her sister to begin with and because she lost she said, screw it, I'm taking my toys and leaving. So yep. she used the magic word and destroyed everything and ruined the entire board. She's the person who flips the risk board game, okay? Yes. Like, 
But but she still didn't win. She's well. She won. Define winning. Yeah. I don't think I don't think winning is the state of mind she's in. She's she's playing from her back foot still. I mean, she's evil. Yeah. She she corrupts herself so terribly by doing that even that there's no good in her anymore, right? Right. She, it's just about control. And I like how as like as Diggory approaches her, he thinks she's this beautiful woman, and then they're like, okay, let's go back, and then taps the bell, boom. And then as they get to know the witch, slowly but surely, his image of her, the facade of her beauty, dies as she explains her situation. It's like slowly throughout her description, Diggory's opinion of her changes from beautiful, majestic to holy cow, this woman is evil. And in, in, in just the period of her talking, you can just tell by the way Diggory reacts in the, in the narration. Until they come to our world and then... She's like, wow, she is gorgeous. And also, no, that's tall. when they said, Carry me away. no, that's when they talk <laughs> about Uncle Andrew finding her gorgeous. No, yeah, Diggory also says that. They all, yeah, they, she's consistent. Well, he says that her beauty okay. returns. That doesn't mean his opinion of her changed. I guess oh, true, just, but he does say that she's Polly like, didn't like, thing. Polly didn't like her the entire time. Well, you know, Polly's just feminine jealousy. No, <laughs> Polly is the only smart character in that book. Is really You're probably right about that. Other than Aslan, obviously. Well, yeah. And, and well, the yeah, I find so interesting about Abby. this. Um, so go, for, stemming from the screw tape level letters. Um, the screw tape level. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a building project. I do think it's interesting that the main antagonist, is she, is she the main antagonist of every single story? No. Uh, no. She, she's in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, though. She's gone after that, though. Oh, okay. Yeah. Does another person like her take that take that spot? Uh, the kind next of. group is people. Yeah, it's mostly people after the first book. And then it, I mean, okay, uh, the third book. If you're going chronological order, there is there even a villain? I guess there's technically the, um, it's like the jihad, uh, crus- versus crusade kind of concept. And- <laughs> what? Yeah, no, isn't there the because the one group, um, the Tartar? What group is it that they that they're called? I forget. There, it's the one group. That's I guess it still makes my Tartar. point without knowing this information. Is that you have literally Jesus as a lion? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And then there is no like actual like Satan antagonist in this in these series. It's just people sucking. Um. Not at the end. At the last. Book. No, doesn't doesn't oh, wow. a, doesn't the last villain kind of culminate in a Satanist type character? Yes. Okay, that's an what I antichrist thought. kind of character. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's what I was asking, guys, and you just like led me astray. Well, no, because in between that, there is human conflict because more humans come to Narnia. Oh, I know. That's Prince Caspian, right? That happens. In that but one. not just it's not just Prince Caspian. More people came prior to Prince Caspian's people, hmm. so. You have um, obviously the Cabbies uh, family up in Narnia, mm-hmm. but then you have another group that comes, which is basically Middle East in its culture, and they're in like the southern area. I I forget what the map looks like, but the the horse and his boy is basically a whole story where some people are two the two characters start off in the south and go to the north. Um, Oh, I still think it's interesting that he has Aslan as such a main character, but they don't have the corrupting force the entire time. You said he's cor- cor- well, I mean, they do, they do have Aslan. Uh, well, I guess I you shouldn't say give it's away. Pagan. You could say it's pagan influences in the in the meanwhile, because they're, like a new group comes in that denies all things aslan and narnia right it's they're trying to get rid of anything that speaks right so everyone is hunted if they are of that old lineage of narnia and aslan so there there's a different element there right it's the persecution of it would be uh, reminiscent of the persecution of christians and then you would have um constantine is Caspian basically? 
that's that's how I view it. Okay. Yeah, they do. Yeah, I think I, I think we uh, branched off with yes. They do state the though. <laughs> they do state that um, Satan in the Chronicles of Narnia is most represented by Jadis the White Witch. They do state that outright. Well, I mean, let's assume that because that's what that character so represents. But there's a very important caveat here too, and that is that C.S. Lewis never intended to write another book, ever. You mean Lion, entire, after Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? Yeah, in his yeah. entire uh, writing of this Chronicles, mm -hmm. he never intended to write the next book that he writes. Every time. Well, yeah, he always so, wanted it to be, like, essentially, like, self-contained books. So he never intended to write anything after The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Then he adds Prince Caspian. Then he And he never intended to write anything after that. Then he adds the Don Treader. And... He didn't intend to write anything after that. But then he writes the other stories. <laughs> so it, it's one of those things where that's why he's like, it probably doesn't matter what order you read them in, but mm -hmm. it's hard as chronological. Oh, so there is the character Tash, too. Which one's Tash? He's the bad guy in The Horse and His Boy in The Last Battle. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that one's more like a pagan deity that represents a Satan-style character. So that one's is, also another. Isn't that one. kind of a Molochy? Yeah, kind of. But he—he's—he's he's the one that kind of takes over the bad guy role from. Yeah, well, I guess it, it ties into the screw tape Clover letters. Gosh, I keep screwing it up. Uh, <laughs> where C.S. Lewis explains his, his theology and how there are yeah. a bunch of little demons and mm -hmm. not so much as like one big one that interacts with us. So like, it kind of explains like you know the witch is a little demon, and then you have this other guy that you just mentioned is also a little demon. So again. This yeah. similar themes throughout his books. It's it's one of those things where the witch brought evil into the world, in a sense. But it's not the only way that things can come in. Yeah, well, Aslan blames the boy for bringing the witch yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, bringing evil into the world. That's the main that, evil, yeah. right? And yes. then uh, everything else is kind of a minor actor towards a culture of evil. Yes. That would destroy everything that Narnia is good for in the sense of talking horses yeah. <laughs> and the dwarves and everything. So, hey, hey, Chris, how did you feel about the Cabbies family having uh, interrelations with the uh, like forest goddesses and stuff? Made me think what? of your fascination with the um, Book of Enoch. <laughs> <laughs> what on earth are you talking about? Having the, relations? You know, the, yeah, the yeah. Cabbies family marries into the... Uh, nymphs. Yeah. The Mary nymphs, bro. Tree gods. He says gods, actually. What? I think the, the guys marry nymphs and Hold then on the... a second. Did I... I was tired when I read that last chapter. Is that in the last chapter? <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. the last chapter. Yeah. Because their kids need somebody to marry. Yeah. There's no humans on this planet besides them. So the trees and the rivers... It's the trees and rivers. I don't remember that. <laughs> I definitely don't remember it takes that. Takes an element of Greek um, mythology and plays it in. Hold on. The boys I married remember. nymphs and the girls married wood gods and river gods. See, yeah. How do I not remember this? Oh, I love the lamppost. How that grows. That was cool. Right, right. But I think it's only as cool because I know know how that's used in the first book. The. We kind of deviated again <laughs> from yeah, no. the... What? Are you uh, sure about this? Yes. I, I don't recall that in the book at all. I just read it, Chris. <laughs> I literally just read it out of the book, man. Chris is downgrading his opinion of this book as we <laughs> yes, speak he is. right now. Um, <laughs> so after that, when they... Go, when I mean, they to be fair, in this, in this book, the Jesus character is Aslan, who's a lion, who's not actually a person. So, you know, C.S. Lewis kind of does his own thing. Jesus is often represented as a lion. Yeah. <laughs> in the Chronicles of Narnia. It just in mythology in general, man. He's actually yeah. referred to as a lion in scripture. Yeah. Well, yeah, but not literally a lion. How do you know? <laughs> I mean, but it's a thing that in art, it, it's very symbolic of him. It's not an odd yeah, It's usually a lion person. with a lamb curled up at his feet. Yeah. yeah. The, so after... I remember this. They awaken the witch, and mm -hmm. she's trying to understand how they even got there because she realizes that's a way out, right? Yes. Uh, they don't realize 
I get, they make another mistake, right? They don't realize that anyone who's touching them mm-hmm. can be brought through with the ranks. So they brought her there, and she's basically dying in the mm-hmm. in the world between worlds. That was a weird. She scene. doesn't belong there. She doesn't, well, because she's evil, and the place is not is not. Bad. It, it's the the, the peacefulness it's right? the peacefulness of the world between worlds cannot be felt by someone who is uneasy and evil. You, know, you can make the same well, argument about a brand new world, world that's being created before their eyes. Well, yeah, she yeah. she did not like it. As she didn't, singing she didn't go angry. like into a weird hunchback mode though. She didn't go into weird hunchback mode. You're right about that. So the while she's there, she's almost dead, right? They could have mm-hmm. left her there, but she manages to grab onto him again, and then they bring her to to Earth, down into London, right? Mm-hmm. And Uncle Andrew is smitten. <laughs> goes, yep. dresses like a freaking fool, and then offers to take her all over town. <laughs> yep. In which case, she gets violent real fast because she yes. thinks she's something special. And there's a whole big commotion of violence. And the only way to stop her is to get her with the rings again. So that's the what... The rings of power. The rings of power. So they manage to do that, but they take along... What's the horse's name again? Forget oh, it's Strawberry. Strawberry. And the cat... But he becomes Fledge. Yes, yes. So the, you now have this poor horse and cabbie dragged along with Uncle Andrew, the witch, and the two kids. And they're trying to bring them to the old world, Karn, again, but it's destroyed, right? Because the, mm-hmm. the sun was dying. So they go into this dark planet that's a new world. And then Aslan starts singing and creating the world of Narnia. Um, what page did you read about the cabbie's kids? Oh Dude, my that's gosh. That's the very this end, Chris. So... You're still on that? Why okay. do you not it, believe us? In my version, it's on page 184. 184? Let me see if I've got It's this. literally like the it's second. The, it's like the third the page to last. It talks about their lineage, Chris. So while the, while we're well, on I'm, this, I got a lot more pages to go. So. <laughs> Chris is really <laughs> scared by this. So while we're on this, <laughs> uh, they're in this new world, and Aslan starts singing. The world's the world is just coming to life. They don't see Aslan right away. No. And he, at this point, Uncle Andrew's just viewing it cynically as all can be. Right? He's viewing mm-hmm. it from the how he can profit off of the rings and bringing people to this world. Yep, immediately. Yep. And then they're the cabbie and strawberry and the kids are just happy because it's the most beautiful sounding music on the uh, they've ever heard, right? Mm-hmm. They can tell that it's exciting. Everything's just good feelings. And Chris, are you looking it up still? No, I found it. Okay. <laughs> it's just bothering me now. <laughs> and, and then <laughs> then they finally see <laughs> right? And you have Uncle Andrew and the witch both freak out mm-hmm. the second they see the source of the magic. Yep. And she throws the lamp post that she ripped off in the on Earth mm-hmm. and used as a weapon, which is how the lamp post ends up growing because the Earth, the new world is so fertile and mm-hmm. music is causing everything to grow. And Uncle Andrew basically convinces himself everything is just uh, roaring. And the witch ran away. So all the animals, all the trees, everything gets created. Mm -hmm. And they're just kind of there trying to figure out what they should do. (laughs) And they go talk to Aslan. Thanks to Strawberry, who's a great intermediary. Mm Mm-hmm. And they're given a task by Aslan to go get the apple. Yes. You know, I guess that's something you just have to accept in the Chronicles of Narnia is the fact that Aslan gave the the um, intelligence slash sentience slash freedom of will 
to more than just humans. And that's just something you have to accept in the Chronicles of Narnia because that's the way it's written. I so mean, like, it's a, it's, Chris is it's really struggling it with it. It is it's what it is. It's a book, Chris. Chris. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, like, because because you guys mentioned the Christian no, okay, themes and the okay. fact that they made it with the the wood nymphs and oh, the yeah. wood gods. But, and but all that. Chris, the important. So I'm just thing, saying, like, it's just something you have to accept because Aslan gave. All I mean, there's creatures. talking snakes and donkeys in the Bible. Yeah, but hey, can, oh, can, oh, 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 oh. hey, Chris, Chris, can I just point out something to you real quick? The oh, you're talking about a Balaam's donkey that got. That yes, the, that was that was literally. Hey, but Chris, that's different. Hey, Chris, <laughs> very different. Chris, okay. go ahead. Okay. Narnia, you're you're forgetting something. Was okay. not a world created for humans. No, no, it was not. Right, that's a fact. You're right. It's a world created for those animals that were meant to kind of like in the Noah's Ark edition, where you have the two taken from every group to be made special mm -hmm. right yeah. they were going to be like the up the uplifted uh unit of each of those species um <clears throat> to kind of be their own adam and eves right so it, the key to realize here is that aslan is the same god that create like he's the same god uh entity that created adam <laughs> and eve that like, he's just saying son of adam to that like that's the whole point there where he's like well you're here now <laughs> right right and then he makes them fit mm -hmm. it's like a jigsaw puzzle he had to cut himself i mean it's like it's like the similar really and yeah, yeah. Uh, you guys I, I know you guys have read this book i don't know why i asked but they you know I have. I don't know if Andrew has. I haven't read it yet. But oh, a uh, Yuvatar, who's a creation guard, God starts singing everything into existence, and then his like lesser. Well, they're angels, but like the man, lesser it's gods. almost like J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis were friends or something. Yeah, it's not like they're part of a writing club, <laughs> club called the Inklings, um, but they sing everything into existence. The lesser gods join in the chorus. Things are starting to get made, and then you have one that's discordant. So it may, he starts making his own rhythm, and it's it's a little bit weird. And that ends up being Morgoth. Um, right. But Ayuvatar uh, actually weaves that into creation. So he basically absorbs that. And it's like part of the plan from the beginning. So it's essentially what Aslan is doing here. It's, it's very similar. Mm -hmm. I will say, uh, speaking of Silmarillion, j just for anybody who likes the Rings of Power, the entire Rings of Power season one is contained on one page of the Silmarillion. The entire first season. Okay, All of it. let's just one point page. out that that's a terrible TV series. It is. It, it is. It's, it, it is. They they screwed up a decent storyline that's a one pager in the Silmarillion. With well, they only had access to, to the it. appendices. They didn't have access to the Silmarillion. They should never have made a show. No, I have no, no idea how. Choice. Okay, can we just point out that the Tolkien estate committed highway robbery though with how much they charged? I'm sure. Well, the thing is, they probably threw out a ridiculous number thinking they would say no. And then they said yes, and, and they're, they're like, like, "Oh, oh, okay." <laughs> All right, I'm convinced that's what happened. They're like, yeah. they're never gonna pay like a billion dollars for six pages, <laughs> right? So I mean, he, if, if they, <laughs> there were six pages, <laughs> but if, if we if we uh, if we look at Narnia though. Narnia like, has been managed much better. The Narnia movies have held up much better than the Rings of Power ever will. Although the Lord of the Rings well, is you know, untouchable it, at this is point. Is Cas being a bit old in his movies? I'm, if I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember correctly. I mean, that never really bothered me that much. I don't know. It, it bothered me a little bit because it completely changes. It changes so much. It really does. Uh, I'm just saying, like, as far as being a good movie, though, like, it wasn't Aragon. Yeah, yeah the Eric movie was terrible. <laughs> that was one of the worst movies I've ever watched. I just think you could I do, do think you could do this one on a pretty low budget and do a yeah. good job, though. You could, and well, that's what Netflix you just is spend currently the working budget on. on them creating the world. That's it. Yeah, that's pretty much what you spend it on. And a singing lion, which would be really weird to see. Well, the BBC tried it, and it was uh, cringeworthy to say the to say the least. It's hard for it not to be a little. <laughs> Have you? Did you guys watch that at all? Like in the first ten minutes, there was so much cringe, I had to turn it off. No, I didn't, <laughs> no, watch, I didn't watch it. it. So I think it was bad because it's the BBC. Mm -hmm. Although the lion did did talk, and they must have done something. 
honestly, the one that I'm most excited for being made is the horse and his boy. You know, it's funny you keep saying that. Like, I don't ever remember even liking that one. That one is my favorite one. I but don't I, know I, we're going to reread it, so we'll find out. All right, so here's the next thing I wanted to ask you. Oh, we didn't finish the mission. So yeah, Aslan so starts to cry. He makes a pact with the boy. Yep. Yep. The boy makes a pact with, with the lion. And then he goes off to the Garden of Eden, clearly. Yep. And yep. Uh, he's tempted to take an apple for himself. The boy says, no, which not doing it this time. Ooh. <laughs> and then, oh, first, first, actually, uh, a couple of interesting things happen. Uh, when, so Aslan makes a pact with the boy. Um, with Diggory, and then he also changes the name of the horse, which is something that also happens in Christian stories, uh, where God makes a covenant. So he makes a covenant with the horse. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Because like you know, you go from Abram to Abraham. Yes. Or like so it goes from go strawberry from, uh, to uh, fledge. Fledge. Or like Simon to Peter. Yeah. There's a lot of name changes in the in the history wings. of Christianity. Say it again. He gets wings. He so becomes a Pegasus. Pegasus. Yes. Pegasus, so he can fly the children to the garden. Yep. They stop along the way because they can't get there all in one flight out oh, one day. Basically, if I would have, if I was Adam in the Bible, I would have asked God for a Pegasus because that would be so cool. <laughs> Why to <laughs> say there wasn't one? He was riding on his T Rex. <laughs> Why would I'm he need saying. a Pegasus, Chris? Where was he going outside? That, of the I mean, garden? you have a good point, but I still want one. <laughs> he. Uh, <laughs> You can't forget the toffee tree. Or a no, griffin. Oh, yeah, a toffee tree, yes. Yeah, a griffin would have been cool. Um, but, yeah, at the like, garden, there's a whole warning about the fruit. Yeah, they got, like, a po- what, Let me find the poem. There's a gate sign, basically. There's a gate sign with a poem on it. Aslan at least gave them, you know, the the, the um, pause to read, the, <laughs> read what was going to happen to him instead of just saying, don't do it. Right. He's like, hey. If you do this, here's what's going to happen. Let me find it real quick. Actually, I have the PDF right here. I'm just going to use that. <laughs> but then they get the they get the uh, apple after being tempted by the witch to take it for his mother, right? Mm-hmm. Here it is. It says, uh, come in by the gold gates yeah. or not at all. Take of my fruit for others or forbear. For those who steal or those who climb my wall shall find their heart's desire and find despair. So basically, if you get everything you want... From taking this apple, you will also get um, despair. You'll you'll it's you'll like find being out. Being careful it's what empty. you wish for. You yeah. don't well, know what you're asking. It's kind of a weird poem because would it really have been stealing for him to grab one for his mother? Not based on the logic he gives him after the fact. Right. Because it's not you're not taking for yourself. Yeah, but he right. was he made a promise to do something. So that's right. That so he made he made the said. promise to Aslan, yeah. But yeah. but I'm saying like technically based on the logic he was given, if he did not eat the apple himself but took it for his mother, then technically he's following the logic. But he I, I think mean, when I he says he's gonna grab two apples. There's yeah. <laughs> three yeah. apples. What, what's funny is I don't think Aslan says don't take two apples or don't take one to your mom. He just asks for an apple. Go get me an and apple. And says not to eat it himself. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean. And he goes through the gold gates. I mean, the gates opened for him. So it wasn't stealing like the, the you know, the white witch. <laughs> so <laughs> Who she ate climbs one became the wall terrible. for apparently no reason because the gate just opens. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, the whole purpose of this apple or fruit, whatever it is. You uh, needed to bring it to Aslan so that he it could be planted in the middle of Narnia, basically as like a shield from the witch for as, as long as it stands there. I also enjoy this forbearing forbearing in this, where he says, "Coming by the gold gates," and he goes, "Well, who would want to climb a wall if they could get in by the gates?" Yeah. <laughs> and then the witch is like, "I climbed the gates." <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it does beg one question though. I don't think they ever go into it really is how the tree and everything goes away. I think that's the only gap in the entire Chronicles. What do you you mean? What do you mean? The tree being destroyed. I don't think it actually gets destroyed. Does it? You mean destroyed on like an our planet? No, that tree in the Chronicles of Narnia, it's end, right? Because it, it's going to be there to protect them. 
until the tree is gone. How it how the tree is eliminated is never ever discussed no. yeah, in the entire so. chronicles, if I'm not mistaken. Hmm. Um, so okay. it's always it's always been like the one question mark of could they not just plant a new tree? <laughs> like, um, I guess it's, I guess it's, it's just the white tree of Gondor. It is <laughs> the strength of the it kings is. have failed. It's it's the tree of life from the uh, from the Avatar movie. It's because uh, the cabbie starts having sex with the tree goddesses, and then you know God sheds a tear, and it kills the tree. <laughs> well, also, what in uh, what? in uh, what, heck is that? what did you just say? <laughs> yeah, what did you just say? I... <laughs> I, I didn't I didn't actually comprehend a single thing you just said there. Oh my gosh. Dude, that is the stupidest thing I've heard in this entire <laughs> podcast, Will. <laughs> he sheds a tear, so it kills the tree. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. He was, he was so happy he got to watch that, that he shed tears <laughs> of joy and planted more trees. Yes. Oh here's, my here's a question, too, that isn't really discussed um, that I can think of, is the other kingdoms, because it's not just Narnia. There's Archenland. That, there's Archenland. And my question has always been, what happened to Archenland when the White Witch takes over Narnia? Because she's kind of secluded to Narnia. Well, I think this explains it really well, though. Um, basically, when she takes the apple and eats the apple, she notices the juice is darker, right? And then she gets everything she wants, but she's in despair. So she becomes queen of the whatever you, Narnia. I don't remember how much of the land she owns. She only but, ever controls Narnia. Is right. So thing. she she becomes queen of the land essentially, but she's in despair. Like she's always worried somebody will supplant her, somebody will take over, somebody will beat her. She's in despair for the rest of her life. But it's how does it explain her, her not trying to take over the other land? Yeah, that's why it's super weird. She's right? too it's, afraid. She's in despair the whole time. Like, can you imagine? Will, like, no, I guess they, what what happened to them though? Why aren't they attacking? Oh, Archenland. Yeah. No, but it's it's yeah, more know. than that, right? Like, it's um, her wish was never just to rule Narnia, right? It's to rule the entire planet. Because Narnia is just a kingdom; it's a region of that planet. So. When you look at the actual map, it's much bigger than just Narnia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. So you you have to ask the question: Why she didn't just go take other things? She's all powerful. <laughs> it's not like she lacked a strong army mm -hmm. in the line, the witch in the wardrobe. It, there's a whole uh, in the horse and his boy. I'm pretty sure like part of the reason there's a bunch of things in there about why they never attacked North. The, the people in the south. They wouldn't attack because for a while there was the white witch who they feared. That's why and then they eventually try attacking in the horseman's boy. Uh, so there's there's a lot of elements to it that you you gotta think through. So I think that's there's just a couple puzzles, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it, so it sounds like basically... Okay, so the queen was not aware of Archenland. How? So, because she only knew that Narnia existed because she was there during the creation of Narnia, right? And if she's in despair, she never leaves her kingdom. If she doesn't know Archenland exists and it's under her spell, nobody in Narnia is going to give out, you know, go tell her about Archenland, and the spell only reaches the, the entire kingdom of Narnia. And she's only in charge for like a hundred years, nine hundred to a thousand. That's a long time, man. Yep. Yeah, but that's nine hundred years after the magician's nephew. So it took her nine hundred years to get control of Narnia. Like, I mean, think about that. That's like saying like it took Voldemort like eight Harry Potter books to try there. and take over the castle. <laughs> I mean, and it's not just Narnia though. There was also the Etten's Moor or whatever it's called. That was another kingdom, wasn't it? Yeah, basically, uh, land, and then you have the Kalerman at the bottom, which is like the Middle East group. So, I guess so there's only three kingdoms. The statement in here that I'm reading right now is that um, Argentland is like the 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 was it the white uh, whale? It, nobody ever conquers Argentland in the entire Chronicles of Narnia. <laughs> 
all it's the all kings out. and queens of Arch and Land are direct descendants of King Frank and Queen Helen. <laughs> I guess if you wanted to live in a peaceful kingdom, go to Arch and Land. <laughs> when, when does it say that? It's such a plot. The hole. sun goes to rule that. It's at the. Uh, it's at the end. It's at the end, about where you're talking about the nymphs. Yeah, it's like in the same place that you told me to look for the nymphs. Yeah. Here, let me find it. But yeah, I just read that the um, the White Witch never takes Arch and Land. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. It says, on their left, mountains were much higher, but every now and then there was a gap, and you could see between steep pine woods a glimpse of the southern lands lay beyond them, looking blue and far away, and that'll be where Arch and Land is. Yeah, so the Isles and the Arch and Land. Okay. Yeah, there's the So Isles. she probably wouldn't oh. go to the Isles because you know, she's just afraid of the water, I guess. The you seven know. Isles. And Which, Arch and What Land, happened on the Isles? <laughs> that's just the question mark. Well, that's the Prince Caspian it's story. A, it's the it? Stepstones, like in uh, Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah. And their second son became the king of Arch and Land. There you go, right there. There you go, yeah. Yeah. So I guess Archenland just never ever has a big part of Narnia. No, but Archenland <laughs> is actually uh, that's what the whole story is for the horse and his boy. Yeah, but it has nothing to do with the White Witch. I know. I'm just <laughs> saying he's the heir. The White Witch is already gone in the horse and his boy. She's been eliminated. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I do find it interesting that the place where the lantern grows is called Lantern Waste. Like waste, as in like trash that is thrown out, but it it is a prominent part of the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and I wonder if at any point C.S. Lewis is like, how am I going to explain that? And then he wrote it into this book. <laughs> like, I thought this was clever how he it did was. it. Was very clever. Because uh, how else would you explain that? <laughs> Do they ever get to the tree in the other books that has the uh, candies? I don't remember. I, I just assume so. that that would have died off. Maybe. Who knows? Well, I mean, the like the tree of Eden or whatever died, so. Yeah. I mean, does it actually say it died, though? Anywhere in here? I mean, that tree should be right next oh, to the oh, lamp. Yeah. No, the oh, you mean the, the new tree that protected them from the White yes. Witch? Not yeah. the tree, or not the no, OG It was down by the tree. river. Yeah, I don't know. Does it? Well, doesn't the I guess witch I was having a hard convince time somebody to how chop far it down? It doesn't somebody? Doesn't the witch convince somebody to chop it down? Yes, I believe that is. Actually I think that's actually how it happens. It's like, like oh, we'll, we'll chop down all. the tree for wood for your. Fire I don't remember where where that's described though, but I think she convinces the is it the black uh, dwarves? Isn't no, I thought I thought the, she convinces the friend like the was it Mister what's his face from the Lion, the Witch, Tumnus? and the Wardrobe? Tumnus. Doesn't Mister Tumnus accidentally get it chopped down? No. How does that timeline make sense? Because she's already been ruling for hundred years. Yeah. Now. Oh yeah, that's a good point. No, there was. I thought that there was one of the groups of dwarves or something. There was conflict. They, yeah, she I managed to get it. civil war to happen or something. But. Okay. But yeah, I don't know. The, the whole. I th there's a lot of there's a lot of um, messages within the mm -hmm. magician's nephew. I think if your kid is able to actually understand those messages, maybe if you <laughs> read it to them, I don't know. But uh, there's a lot in there about, you know, trusting your gut. Yeah. Adults, or like what what you have to be concerned about with adults, you know, understanding that you, your best interest is not always their best interest. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot in this. Even mm -hmm. redemption for you, you can make the mistake the first two times and you can get it right the third time. <laughs> so, I think it, I think the book overall is a great addition to the Chronicles that you appreciate more when you can understand it. Okay, so no, I guess the tree just died of old age. Okay. <laughs> Can't this whole new mythology. <laughs> I was just curious. You got you got me stuck on this now because I'm like, how the heck does the tree? But yeah, I guess they just died of old age. They're nine hundred years old. And somebody else says maybe some sat sadder didn't realize it, which tree it was and cut it down to build a nice log cabin. That's exactly what I thought about Mister Tumnus. You know, it's it kind of goes with the concept of the um, 
in Revelation where it's like the what, how many, like thousand year piece or whatever. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Toad year, going for like, a ride in his motor car took the curve a little too fast and struck the tree. <laughs> the beavers, man. The beavers. Mm-hmm. Took beavers. The yeah, they, they, made, they made a dam out of it. In the, uh, they were like, the oh, all this fruit, we have food and shelter. <laughs> And then they they all got everything they wanted, but they lived in despair because they ate the apples. Yeah. It's like so. the, it's the line from uh, Gladro when she's being tempted by the ring. All shall love me and despair. Oh, no, my, my one of my uh, actually what's funny is this story is kind of similar to what happens in the Harry Potter books where Voldemort tries to kill Harry Potter and makes him more powerful than he ever could have imagined because of the horcrux crap but um basically the witch eats the apple tosses the core and oh boom look there's a tree that you'll never be able to get out of here again or get your your the, the protection what? exists because the of the apple. That, man the witch doesn't do that no no because she ate the apple oh and then the core that's planted protects narnia no because... yeah but not her core not her. i didn't say her core, <laughs> no, said the core. It, that's how it came off. a core from the same tree Ugh! Ruining my 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 allegory here. My I mean, but she would have died otherwise anyway, so it wouldn't have been mm. a big deal. She would have died otherwise. Yeah, I mean, of old age. If she didn't she's eat the apple. Immortal. Yeah, if she didn't eat the apple. She I mean, she's a immortal. witch. She was suspended in time for God knows how long with Karn. Yeah, but that was like cheating. She is like um one of those reptiles that lowers their. Heart Here's rate. the real question: so Why does she? Why does she suspend longer. herself in the same amount of time? I guess she to prevent herself from dying until somebody could come and save her. That makes she sense. Says. Yeah. yeah. It's, like, it's like it's like a um, allegory to uh, what is it? The uh, cryo chambers. I mean, she's too proud to commit suicide. <laughs> like, <laughs> why would she? Why wouldn't she? You know, hope for some way to escape. So mm-hmm. she's just gonna lock herself away in a way that she doesn't age. Makes I sense. do like that they had Uncle Andrew learn his lesson, though. He never tried any magic again as long as he lived. He had learned his lesson, mm-hmm. and in his old age, he became a nicer and less selfish old man. See, even he gets a redemption arc, even though he's a prick. But he yeah, always but... liked to get visitors alone in the billiard room and <laughs> tell yes. them, thank God it's tell them stories. <laughs> and say <laughs> that she was a damn fine woman. Damn fine. No, no, no. A damn, yeah. a damn fine woman. A damn fine woman. The accent. <laughs> Yes. What is that accent? Dem? What is that that accent? British, bro. (laughs) I know he's British, but I don't know any British speaking people, British speaking, English speaking people from Britain that that talk that way. Dem. He's from London. Also, Chris, there's a difference between reading it and hearing it out loud. (laughs) So it's going to be completely different. (laughs) (laughs) It's. My, my favorite, my favorite dialect was the. Not that he was, he was never rich. Let's just put it that way. My favorite though dialect in the book is the cabbie when he speaks, because man, it's Cockney. Yeah, yeah Cockney. I love that. Uh, all right, so <laughs> plot plot holes aside, plot holes aside, what would you say is the best theme in this book, in your opinion? Hmm. The most prominent, the one you thought the best of. I liked how you couldn't trust the uncle <laughs> i know honestly i think that that's like probably the best message to children there's so many elements of the uncle of like what to be aware or like be wary of that anyone I, in a position of power is right and i mean just the yeah the the two different uh main villains are like a warning to actual people that exist in this world <laughs> You have I actually really politician. liked. I liked uh, Aunt Letty though a lot too, though. Yeah, but I'm saying like you have two characters, right? That are just symbolic of all the people you can't trust. There's the uh, power hungry leader that views you as just a number to their end mm-hmm. goal. You're you're just you're, they don't see anything about you that's valuable. There's the person who's the mad scientist mm-hmm. who's like. Ends justify the means, doesn't mm-hmm. think about any consequences on his own either, right? So, and then the add in the element that he's your uncle, and you get the child abuse concept yep. that like to be wary of and to trust your gut when something doesn't seem right. Get the heck out of the room. So, it even has the ice, you know, the the uh, 
person in the creeper van element with him trying to lure her <laughs> over with the ring, shiny object, right? Yeah. So between the witch and Uncle Andrew, C.S. Lewis really covers every villain that a child that age needs to be kind of wary of. Yes, agreed. Yeah, and he also points out that you can you can trust some adults, obviously, with you know Aunt Letty jumping the in the way and keeping Andrew away, and and the cabbie. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it, it's just one of those things that where I don't think you can necessarily appreciate that message until you're kind of older. <laughs> I think that's why this one, even though it was written to be the first book, why some people say reading in publication order is an acceptable way to read these books. I mean, yeah, but you're still going to read them all in, like, in one go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, <laughs> but you might be more likely to catch the allegory if you've read the other books first. Maybe. I don't, I don't know. know. No, I, mean, I think I think this is less distracting to see the White Witch in this form, actually, because you view her as the White Witch otherwise from the yeah. beginning. And this one, she's kind of humanized first before yeah, you realize she's a villain. And then you understand what makes her a villain versus her being this person already ruling with mm -hmm. an iron fist. You get to see the development of the villain. I'd say the, the biggest theme to me was the second chances. There's a lot of second chances in this book, a lot of chances for redemption. Mm-hmm. And although, yeah, you can't trust adults is a common theme across this book, or you can't trust all adults anyway, it's a good, good point across this book. I do think that there is a constant theme of even if you've screwed up, you still have the, uh, the ability to redeem yourself. Like Diggory screwed up multiple times, still redeems mm -hmm. himself. Obviously, Aslan never screws up, but the White Witch is given a lot of redemption chances and instead chooses to continue to be wicked. Uncle Andrew gets lots and lots and lots of chances to stop going down the path he's on. And it's all the way at the very end he decides, you know what? I screwed up. Time to be time to be the right kind of person, finally. Um, Polly. Polly screws up a couple times. But she keeps coming back because she's got loyalty. The cabbie. The cabbie is the one character that I would say did not screw up at any point in the book. Really. They didn't um, have a chance to. Just, which is yeah. why he's given the ultimate... Uh, position of king of narnia with his wife mm -hmm. um because he's he's the one character that that truly was not he didn't even mean to be there he was doing the right thing at the right time oh, and so was accidentally drawn in i missed it speaking of the wife how did she get there uh, the cabbie says I, my wife though and he goes oh here she is yeah. okay world. all right <laughs> yeah it was like it's it was like so random the fact that he has power in both worlds which yeah. which is to explain why you even get the kids going there in the first place with Lucy and Edmund and mm -hmm. Peter and Susan, right? Because he he has a foot in all the worlds, so it kind of does that tie in. Mm. He's he's basically proven to be the king of the 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 um, what is it the woods between the worlds? He's in charge of that. I mean, he's God. If God created more than one universe, so. in fact, in a different one of the books, he actually is in the wood between the worlds and sends people to other worlds. I think that's in the silver chair he does that. Couldn't tell you I haven't read the book. It's you haven't read so the silver long. chair at all? It's no, man, so I've only long. read this one okay. in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. It's the only ones that's, I've read. You haven't read the rest of them? This is not a secret. You're, you're, totally you're in for a treat, Will. Yeah. I'm, I'm not going to lie. The, the rest of them are pretty good. but Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're still children's as, stories. They're deep, yeah. but they're children's stories. I'm I'm actually looking forward to the later one, rereading the later ones, just because I don't know if I really appreciated them as much. Yeah, it's video. been a very long time since I've read these books. I, I was a kid when I read them, and I think Andrew was too. Yeah. So, all right. Do you guys have anything else you want to say about the magician? Random. You brought up Harry Potter before, so the main character na name is Diggory, and it's Cedric Diggory in the fourth book of Harry Potter is the main character. And he and Harry Potter touch a magical object that transports them to another place. Huh. Yeah, maybe J.K. Well, sure Rowling was accidentally subconsciously <laughs> including the Chronicles of Narnia. I'm sure it's on purpose. She did, was, she did yeah. lots of stuff like that. Did she? Yeah. yeah. 
I she, didn't realize that. that she likes to do stuff like that. Yeah, she incorporates. Honestly, like I don't think she is as strong of a writer as far as the plot holes as many other sure. writers, but she did a good job of paying homage to many of the greats. When you talk about plot holes, the real plot hole is how terrible that world would be. <laughs> in real. It makes literally You're, no sense. Well, when you get to what was it, book six, where everyone's throwing out love potions and stuff, it's, <laughs> it's a, that's just a sprinkling of how dark that universe. Could well, that's look. how they create Voldemort. Is his, his dad gets raped? That's yeah. how that happens. What? Yes, what? you didn't know yeah. that. What? Under, his his dad was under a love potion the entire time. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. Why, that's why. That's yeah, that's why he uh, Voldemort is so screwed up. That's why he's an orphan. That's why he goes and kills that family later. Yes. But my favorite meme about Voldemort is like they talk about uh, they go, you know, the emperor tries to take over the entire galaxy and fails and then the, or succeeds for a little while but then gets beaten and then they have like uh, uh, Sa- Sauron tries to take over Middle Earth and he succeeds and then fails. And then you got Voldemort never takes over a high school. <laughs> <laughs> like, of all the things, he's just trying to take over hey, the high school. Fairness like. to the White Witch, you know, she does rule Narnia for a while. She does, yeah, yeah. yeah she does. I mean, technically, Sauron rules several times. I'm just, I'm just saying, like, the meme was simplified. I know. I'm just being a dick. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> but then you compare, like, I've fails. seen the meme where they compare Hermione to whatever the main character's name in is Twilight, and that character oh, wow. in Twilight is actually never described. <laughs> Wait, they don't, really? Yeah, they don't have any description of the, of the person. Well, she's not the main character. She's just a... Uh... She's literally just. Oh, a, uh, a, uh, is it? You're talking about Bel- Bella. 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 Yeah. yeah, she's literally I was gonna say a, Bell. Uh, it's like that's the a beast, lens the to beast. view Edward from. Yes. Because all she does is describe his beauty, like every ten pages or so. Pine hey, after a vampire. Did you know that a lot of the, well, you guys know this, but it was an eye-opening moment for me when I got to be an adult and I looked up like the actual tales behind some of these Disney stories. Like, they're example, dark. Yeah. You know how yeah. dark the Little Mermaid is. Yes. <laughs> That like is a constant dark freaking story. Oh gosh, that's the movie I want to see. The, the dark one? one, yeah, the dark one. I, like oh, the thing oh. is, those original children's stories had a, again a lot of moral messaging to them. Yeah, um, and it's lost in the Disney ones. Whereas, like you know, there's still good messages in a lot of the old Disney shows, but it's not the same. Okay, then what the, would the, what would the message be in the Little Mermaid? Will. Don't don't try to change your physical body. You know how long it's been since I've read that. I don't. Could Dude, you tell you got like? Is that what they're trying to say? The message in all the Disney movies is about you know perfection. That's what the problem is. Chasing right? perfection will never yeah. fix you. No, no, no they all. That. No, they always have the perfect happily ever after story. Oh, okay, but the mermaid, Little Mermaid, is yeah, nice. but that's fun. Like Little so Mermaid has the perfectly ever after. Yes, it does. I'm not she saying falls off it. the cliff. What are you talking a, about? The real a, Little Mermaid. She falls I'm off the cliff about and the dies. Real. I'm about oh, okay. Disney. That's what I thought you were trying to tell me. I was, I was like, yeah, I was like, geez, dude. Like, oh. that is not a happy ending. She yeah. dies. All the Disney ones have perfectly ever after, you know, happily ever after stories. Yes, so. the Disney ones do. I'll give you that. The Disney mm-hmm. is happily ever after. Yeah. It's like Goldilocks actually gets eaten. Oh, yeah. She's, that's a, true. she's a picky biatch. <laughs> yes. That's a great moral story. I think. More so what about Little Red Riding Hood then? Huh? She gets eaten too. She does. Oh yeah, the axe man comes in and somehow pulls her out of the wolf's mouth. No, I think I she just gets eaten. <laughs> she doesn't actually die. I thought she did. In the no, real one or in, in the story? I think she actually gets rescued. Oh, okay. Hold on. Let's look this one up now. That's apparently an allegory to um, rape, though. The Big Bad Wolf, is, that's what that is. Real story. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Not really sure how, like, hurt him eating the grandmother factors into that story, but... Because <laughs> he'll hurt, uh, in a sense, that, or, like, you need to make sure you have, like, a legit protector. <laughs> no, this has, this has, like, a real happy ending. The real tale of Little Red Riding Hood. A woodcutter in the French version or a hunter in the Brothers Grimm and a traditional German versions comes to rescue with an axe 
and cuts open the sleeping wolf, letting Little Red Riding Hood and her grandmother emerge shaken but unharmed. Okay, there you go. So she does get eaten. I just forgot about the part where he gets cut out. She gets See, cut you, out. Need, you need the big, strong woodcutter to protect you. I want to know how big this freaking wolf is that it could swallow them unharmed. Like That's I a mean, dire wolf, bro. <laughs> that is a dire huge wolves weren't actually wolf. actually that big. Yeah, but they yeah. that big, but... Um, that's more like the this taking the wolf from North mythology, whatever his name is. Um, um one second, Fenrir. Yeah, it's taking from uh, that thing and putting it into the story. <laughs> that isn't that like a world eater wolf? <laughs> Not a world eater, but it's a giant ass. Wolf. He's huge. His his mouth is like a size of a cave, and it his yeah. drool creates a river. Yeah, so it's basically taking that myth and turning it into a rape allegory that's actually one of my favorite stories in norse mythology i don't know if you want to get into it or not but maybe another podcast okay. <laughs> but yeah i well okay how would you rank the magician's nephew then because we already said what we liked most about it but our rating scales are one to five right one to five and i gave screw tape low letters of four so i'm gonna have to give this one a lower score <laughs> yeah to, yeah um, oh my gosh! I guess the Little Red Riding Hood goes deeper than that, though. Uh, there was there Chris was an original is just completely version. Completely distracted. He has no idea. Oh what's my going gosh! On. No, the original version was was the Riding Hood and the Giant. Uh, apparently, the the Giant breaks apart the grandmother and then feeds it to Little Red Riding Hood, and then uh, and then convinces Red up? Riding Hood to essentially jump in the Giant's mouth and get eaten herself. And there's no happy ending to this story. Okay. <laughs> Whatever. This is the stuff of nightmares. <laughs> I feel like sometimes Chris is just having his own podcast. Oh, yes. God. All right, I'm point. done with that. All right, so. Uh, out, of five, conclude... out of five. Out of five. Yeah, out of five. Where do you put it, Will? It's tough. So as a children's story, I feel like we can have different categories. You can have a different use. category for this because it's a, yeah. I'm going to say. Up. You say that, though. Do you know there's an adult version of the Chronicles of Narnia? It does exist. You know what the difference really? is? Well, it's a C.S. C. S. Lewis wrote a foreword for the adult version that's not included in the children's version. That's it. That's it. That's it. Okay, and it's then for whatever story. reason, they call one the adult edition and one the children edition. But they're the same book. One's got a foreword on it. Okay. Instead of apples, it's boobies. Anyway, so. <laughs> yeah. um, oh, man. Um, Will is always about that. Four. I would say a four. You'll a get a four, four because of a as a child a children's novel okay um, yeah because it's still really good it has really good themes but i mean comparing it even within its own series it's not the most exciting book so and i liked it as a kid uh, and i like it as an adult as well that more and more exciting i have like a two-tier rating to this just okay because it's like the the lessons to be learned in it i think put is, is five worthy but the story itself is not okay the story itself is like a three. So you're gonna average it to a four. So Good. I'm okay, move on. Four. Yeah. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. So you gave it a five, Will? No, no. four. Four. So how, how does his, how does his three how does his three? No, because I have two things that I'm looking at. I'm looking at it from the the. Oh, the, so your like, average is a four. My average is a four. Okay, so it's four and, less, and four. The lessons for kids to learn and like take that. from this book are definitely five worthy. Mm -hmm. The problem is the story itself is kind of boring. So, but well written. Yes. Which makes it a three. That a three. So I'm averaging it to a four, to be aligned with Will. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, if if I had never read Paralandra, I'd probably give this book a five. But since I've read Paralandra, and I know that C.S. Lewis has written better... Which one did he write first? Uh, now you're going to make me sidetrack. One second. Give me a sec. I'll tell you. It, was, it, was it published before 1955? Because that's Magician's Nephew. Magician's Nephew says 1950. No, no, 50, 55, 55. 55, you're right. And then... I think that was the 40s, the other one. Well, this book sucks because it doesn't have the original <laughs> copyright date on it. Well, I think about 2013 was when they published the 50 years anniversary of the... Or no, 75 years. It was 75 years, I think, in 2013. 
So how backtrack from 2013, 75 years, and I think it's in the 40s. Or maybe the late 30s. Yeah, anyways, um, I think the Space Trilogy was first. Well, the Space Trilogy was not made for children. No, it was not. And it also did not have nuclear weapon angst. So this the Space <laughs> yeah. Trilogy was definitely first because it was written before the Second World War. So there you go. Okay, so yes. yeah, see, no... no no uh, nuclear weapon angst and made for adults, not children. So your criticism of it not being as good. Let me finish what I was saying. I felt like Paralandra was a much better retelling of the Genesis story where it was, it was more compact of a story and didn't try going into too many different things at once. I feel like this book is about as concise and um, consequentially as uh, specific as like a shortened version of the Silmarillion, the intro. So like this, this book's all over the place. And yes, it's an adventure, but it dabbles in different things over and over again. It never like is concise. And the story of Paralandra yeah. is way more self-contained. Also as and creates the entire world in like in 30 seconds. Yeah, this, this book, <laughs> this book is is sporadic because it has to explain things in the Chronicles of Narnia that were never meant to be explained. While I love what the story is trying to convey, this is the most out of place book in the entire series. So I'm going to give it a four. <laughs> <laughs> it's like IGN. <laughs> no, no. Actually, if, if I had, I, I think it's if, for, for, if, if, the, five. if the best in the Chronicles of Narnia books is a five, then this is probably a three. But when I'm comparing it to other books in general, I give it a four because it is a good book. All right, so all fours is what we're going with. I think so. Yeah. 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 There's worse. We gotta start tracking these. I, don't know, <laughs> so I think there is a worse. Them. I think there is a worse book in the. In Chronicles, uh, well, the last battle's not as good as I would have hoped. Because, yeah, I was going to say, I don't really enjoy the last battle, but also I don't really... I'm trying to think... I wonder, if that, I wonder if my opinion of the last battle will change as an adult, though. That's, that's, what I, that's what I'm trying to reserve judgment on, is I'm the silver chair and last battle I think I might like more after the fact. Yeah, because they're self-contained. They don't follow the same characters Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe does. Yeah. Um, I find it interesting in the silver chair that C.S. Lewis goes out of his way to say, like, this is why these people can't come back. They're too old for Narnia. I'm like, what? <laughs> but we'll get we'll get to that later. We'll get to that when we read the silver chair. But um, I, I am enjoying going back and rereading these because as an adult, I feel like you get a whole new perspective on these. Mm -hmm. And it reinforces my idea that my kids should read them. <laughs> <laughs> Besides that one part about the... Uh... Guys having sex with the, the uh, goddess. It doesn't specifically say that, but it alludes to that. <laughs> anyway, Chris is just going to have the little disclaimer for his kids. This is not <laughs> endorsed by Catholic tradition. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, he is Anglican, so there's that. So, anyways, as always, I'm Chris. I'm Will. And I'm Andrew. And uh, you've just finished the second episode of Printed and Pressed. We're not talking about t-shirts. Nope. See you later, guys.